Okay, welcome back, everyone. Um, I'm going to just introduce our next set of speakers. Um, we actually have a recorded presentation from Chris Knapp because he couldn't be here today. Um, he had a conflict. And um, we also have Mark, who will be um, available in the chat to, um, to answer questions. So let me just give a quick intro uh, for both of those folks in case you don't already know who they are. Mar Chris Knapp is an accessibility consultant and tester who operates a disability-owned business called Accessiversity. Chris joined the Sakai community in 2020 to help um, with accessibility testing and quality assurance, and now he's the accessibility team lead. Um, he's also a member of the Sakai PMC. And as someone who is statutorily blind and has to rely on screen readers and other assistive technology, he's got a unique perspective on accessibility and um, understanding the specifics needed. Um, so our other uh, speaker today is Mark Golbeck, and he's a software developer for learning experiences. He's been working on Sakai since Sakai 19, and currently he's working on upcoming releases with the Accessibility Group and also with QA. And as I mentioned, he'll be answering questions in the chat during the session and a couple minutes after. So let me um, let uh, Mark kind of introduce himself while I pull up the video. Hello, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Your audio is a little bit low. If you could turn up your volume. Um, let's see. I can't see where it says on the Zoom to up. Yeah, that's better. Okay. All right, as Wilma said, I'm a software developer. I work with uh, Chris Knapp uh, a lot with accessibility. I'm actually working on the VPAT, the last bits of it, getting that finished right now, some of the standards. I do a lot of the keyword testing and the sighted user testing, and I've worked a lot with uh, QA2 in the past, uh, doing a lot of the testing for releases as well. And if you guys have any questions, just ask in the chat, and I'll try to answer them the best that I can. If I don't know the answer, I'll ask Chris, and I'll get back to you. Thank you, Wilma. All right, great. Can you guys see my um, my video in the screen share? It's got the little thumbnail of Chris. Yes. Yep, okay, I can great. see it. All right, so just let me know in the chat if there's anything wrong with the audio. Once I start playing, it should play the audio, but let me know if there's any issues. Hi, I'm Chris Knapp. I'm an accessibility consultant and tester and currently serve as the Sakai Accessibility Team Lead. Today I'm going to be talking to you about our recent efforts to produce VPATs for Sakai 22 and Sakai 23. More specifically, how we were able to reimagine and reinvent our entire VPAT process and report with the end user audience in mind, resulting in what we're referring to as a reviewer-friendly VPAT. If you're not familiar with what a VPAT is, VPAT stands for Voluntary Product Accessibility Template. Basically, it's a tool for performing an accessibility assessment of an information or communication technology product, with the end goal being an accessibility conformance report that describes the extent to which the product complies with various accessibility standards. The VPAT template is developed by the Information Technology and Industry Council and is free to use as long as you adhere with their usage guidelines. So it's proprietary, but only from the standpoint of promoting accurate and consistent reporting, while also protecting the VPAT name and template, which are registered service marks of the Information Technology Industry Council. This slide depicts several key milestones that have occurred over the past four years. It basically represents the time that I've been involved with Sakai. I'm not going to spend time going through all of this, but the big takeaways here are that it was a multi-year effort to develop and implement a community sourced approach to accessibility that eventually led to us being able to produce our own VPAT. Throughout my presentation, I'll be jumping back and forth between two key resources, the Sakai 22 VPAT and the Sakai Accessibility Strategy page on our Sakai LMS website, which is shown here. On this page, you can find all the information about our Sakai accessibility strategy, including the Sakai 22 VPAT, which you can access here in the accessibility conformance report section down at the bottom. So this will be one of the reoccurring themes of my presentation. 
While the goal was always for us to be able to produce our own VPAT, at the end of the day, some 30 or, pages, 30 or so pages of paper are not as important as the underlining strategy that's helping to drive all of this work. If you don't retain anything else from my talk today, at least remember to go to that page on the Sakai LMS website and read about our Sakai accessibility strategy because it's an absolute critical component to all of this work. I won't spend too much time on this particular slide other than to point out that there are several different versions of the VPAT based on the specific accessibility standards you're needing to assess for. There are specific versions for the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, Revised Section 508 Standards, EN 301-549, European Harmonized Standards, and then there is an, interna an international version that incorporates all of these standards into a single report template. Ultimately, the decision on which version of the VPAT to use comes down to your target audience and what specific industries and markets are priorities to you. So as we start going through some of the specific changes that we implemented to make our VPAT more reviewer friendly, the first thing that I want to talk about is this contact information area at the beginning of the VPAT report template. Let me pause here to acknowledge, and I'm aware some of these slides are less than ideal for a fast-paced presentation like this. A lot of these are going to be screenshots of text from our VPAT or from the website, which might be hard for you to read on the fly. But I put the slide deck together, intending it for it, for it to be a leave-behind piece for folks to, be, to refer back to, so please just keep that in mind. So this is pretty self-explanatory, but I just wanna stress that you really wanna think about who to list here, as you would prefer that it's someone who could serve as a single point of contact for fielding questions about the VPAT, as well as for providing technical re assistance about any accessibility related uh, problems that users might be experiencing with your product. For us, this meant listing me, but we felt it would be too confusing or tacky for me to use uh, my business email here. So we created a shared email using the Sakai LMS domain, choosing to go with accessibility at sakailms.org to keep it simple and so it'd be easy for people to remember. So this next one comes to us courtesy of Gonzalo Silverio from the University of Michigan, who has been serving as our informal VPAT advisor. Gonzalo, who regularly reviews VPATs as part of his day job at U of M, was the person who had convinced us to cut down on the amount of supporting information that we are trying to cram into our VPAT report, saying that the reviewers would thank us for keeping things as, as synced and as clear as possible. He then took it a step further and suggested that we actually include a statement about deliberately keeping the VPAT succinct and clear to signal to the reviewers that we're on their side like this language that we ended up adopting for the Sakai 22 VPAT. While we come right out and say that we're doing this to allow folks more time to review our other materials, we're also implying that they'll need to review this supplemental material to get the full picture. So we've technically added to the VPAT report, not by altering the, the standard report template, but rather by extension. For those of you who are reading ahead, you know that this is also the place in the VPAT where we mention our companion resource for the first time. In our case, the Sakai Accessibility Strategy page on the Sakai LMS website. Basically, this page serves as a catch-all for housing all of the supplemental information that we just weren't able to squeeze into the standard VPAT report template. In retrospect, this decision, more than anything else, proved to be a real game changer for us. For the longest time, I had been struggling with how to present all the various aspects of our accessibility strategy that I wanted to talk about without adding pages and pages of narrative to our VPAT report, which I knew could potentially turn off a prospective customer who would have to sift through all of that material. Gonzalo's suggestion of repurposing this information and moving it over to a separate web page proved to be a surprisingly simple solution. For starters, it freed up a lot of the scarce real estate that we within the VPAT report so that we could focus on those essential elements that we needed to touch on. There was also this unintended consequence of freeing ourselves from the constraints of an overly rigid template when we realized that a separate web page would pre present a sort of clean slate and we could choose to organize and present the supplement for, supplemental information however we'd like. 
obviously, as we were thinking about how to set up this page, it made sense for us to use a lot of the same headings that match those used in the VPAT report, which we felt would make it easier for users visiting the website to find that additional information about a particular topic they were wanting to learn more about. But at the same time, we could create our own headings that correspond to these other uh, aspects of our accessibility strategy. If there are these other things that we thought were just as important for a prospective customer to know about. All of the content on this page is neatly indexed, including a series of jump licks for each section. So it's super easy to peruse and allows users to control the amount and type of information they are digesting. The VPAT report was never intended to be a straight up marketing tool. So you want to avoid turning it into an infomercial for your product. When doing a formal accessibility assessment like this, you wouldn't want to toot your own horn too much anyways, as customers tend to see right through that sort of self-serving sales pitch. But where does that leave you in terms of talking about those unique attributes about your organization or product that genuinely help you to stand apart in the marketplace? that contrast your offerings with those of your competitors. For example, one of the unique things about the Sakai VPAT is that there is this entire community of people behind this work. Unlike our competitors, we're not just hiring some outside consultancy firm to slap together a VPAT for us, or including some token disabled users as an afterthought. Our entire community is involved with our accessibility efforts, including the creation of our VPATs, and that is definitely something that is unique and worth calling out. The problem, as I've already alluded to, is that the standard VPAT report template doesn't provide a lot of options for talking about these other aspects of your approach. Instead, for on the Sakai, excuse me, on the Sakai accessibility page, we've carved out some space to include a few brief write-ups along with some photos to showcase these partnerships and extol the benefits of our unique community sourced approach to accessibility. Again, this is pretty self-explanatory and relatively simple thing you can do to connect the dots for the VPAT reviewer. Here we've included a link to our companion resource in the evaluation methods use section of the VPAT report. On the flip side, I already mentioned that we include a link to the Sakai 22 VPAT can be found in the Accessibility Conformance Report section on the uh, Sakai Accessibility page. So we've provided multiple ways for users to navigate to and between these resources. Since there were a number of different things that we needed to cover in the narrative portion of the VPAT report, here we decided to focus on a high level description of the evaluation methods used, including some quantifiable benchmarks that were readily available to us. For us, these included the total number of tools and features evaluated, different types of testing performed, number of screen reader and web browser combinations used, and total number of test cases performed. These metrics are important for several different reasons. First, Assuming that you're continuing to evolve your accessibility strategy like we have, when you look at these numbers from version to version, customers are able to connect the dots to see that there is quantifiable evidence of growth. For example, 23 tools and features were tested for Sakai 22, and for Sakai 23, that number increased to a total of 29 tools and, teacher, and features. For Sakai 22, there were a total of 2,853 test cases performed, and for Sakai 23, that number increased to 5,096, which was a 179% increase from the prior version. Like with Sakai 22, we used four different combinations of screen readers and web browsers when performing our testing for Sakai 23. However, we changed out one of the combinations so that to allow us to test the voiceover plus Safari combination for the first time. Uh, so when it comes to these existing customers, these sorts of metrics show that you are continuing to make improvements to the product from version to version, which may, may factor into their decision as to whether or not they renew. For prospective customers, this sort of transparency could help to establish your track record with them, especially if they view you as an unknown commodity. Whenever you conduct a formal accessibility assessment, inevitably you're going to expose some less than flattering things about your product. 
Addressing known deficiencies can be a somewhat sticky subject, but we felt it was important to hit these sorts of things head on. The word that immediately comes to mind is authenticity. When you talk about authenticity as it relates to your accessibility strategy in VPAT, this can mean several different things. Sakai has been a leader when it comes to incorporating individuals with disabilities into its user testing and community. Individuals with disabilities, for example, blind and low vision users who rely on screen readers and other assistive technologies, are able to provide for an authentic accessibility experience that even the most well-intentioned, non-disabled developers and designers will never be able to fully replicate. Now, as it relates to putting together your VPAT, authenticity means not being afraid to give an honest assessment of your product, warts and all. No software is perfect, and if you're portraying your project as being flawless, either you're being disingenuous or you just haven't tested enough. Part of what any current or prospective customer is looking for when reviewing your VPAT is evidence that you are constantly moving the needle, which means that it's incumbent upon you to demonstrate that the product is continuing to evolve from version to version, including talking about any planned improvements for future releases. By definition, this will project you to, or will require you to project into the future. Fortunately, for forward-thinking organizations like Sakai, we're already using tools like technical roadmaps to plan for future improvements and, and features. So we're able, able to easily repurpose some of this information for this section of the VPAT report. If done right, this can provide customers with some powerful insight into your past, present, and future accessibility efforts, which can speak volumes about your organization's culture and its ongoing commitment to accessibility. For this next item, we'll be diving into the WCAG success criteria table of the VPAT report. The WCAG system for assigning conformance levels is somewhat ambiguous. You can either say that an item supports the WCAG success criteria, partially supports it, does not support it, or is not applicable. The problem is, is that there's really no gray area between the supports and partially supports options. It's kind of an all or nothing deal. So for a complex web application like Sakai, where all these different tools and features that we end up testing, even if we just find a handful of issues, it technically only partially supports that particular WCAG success criteria. Of course, you can use the remarks and explanations field to provide that additional information and context, but you don't want to overwhelm the, the VPAT reviewer. So you want to make sure you keep your comments succinct and that you use consistent formatting to allow reviewers to easily locate the information that they need. Here, we're using one of the sample criteria from our Sakai 22 VPAT report to show the system that we ended up adopting. The image on the far left shows the part of the remarks and explanation field that describes the extent to which Sakai complies with this particular WCAG success criteria, including the specific types of issues observed during testing, testing which prevented us from achieving full compliance. The middle image indicates the types of users impacted and the image on the far right shows where we list out the specific Sakai tools and features where these issues were observed. For this next one, we're showing where we're able to incorporate references to our Sakai user guide, allowing us to highlight our extensive help documentation, which is another potential selling point for a prospective customer. The distinction here is that we're talking about specific WCAG success criteria that were deemed not applicable because the corresponding feature is not included in Sakai by default and only comes into play when there are instances of user-generated content. Of course, at that point, it's up to the individual user to ensure that the content that they're adding is accessible. So to, make, to assist them, we provided them with links to several HARP articles on a variety of accessibility topics. And finally, what this slide is showing is how we are able to insert these blanket statements into some of the revised Section 508 and EN 301 549 tables so that we could remove all these unused rows and cut down on some of the clutter. I should pause here to explain that we're using VPAT version 2.4 International, 
which again includes the WCAG revised section 508 and European harmonized standards all in the same report template. The other thing that you need to understand is that for the most part, the WCAG guidelines are already designed to crosswalk to the revised section 508 and EN 301 549 standards. And you can see evidence of this crosswalk here in this image on the top left, which shows one of the WCAG success criteria. Notice how it lists out the other applicable standards there. So once you've gone through and completed the WCAG success criteria portion of the table, there's really no compelling reason to fill this information out for a second or a third or fourth time, unless of course you're just glutton for punishment, or you're just really wanting to annoy the VPAT reviewer. So when we considered what to do with these other revised section 508 and EN 301 549 tables, which again are essentially reporting duplicative information, we decided to insert a blanket statement like the one shown here at the bottom of the screen and delete the unused portions of the tables. All right, well, that's all the time that we have today. I hope that you found this presentation to be informative and that you at least now have a better understanding of Sakai's approach to accessibility and VPATs. Enjoy the rest of your conversation or conference. Bye, everybody. All right, so that's the end of the video portion. I don't know if you guys have any questions for Mark while, uh, while we have him. Um, we are running right about the end of time. So if you do have a quick question, you can put those into the chat. Just as a quick side note, I, I noticed um, from a couple of people, they mentioned that the transcript, the auto transcript in Zoom was a little wonky there. I'm not sure what's going on with that, but we will see if we can get a more accurate transcript um, attached to it when we upload the uh, recording to YouTube. So hopefully that will we'll fix that in post. Um, <laughs> so apologies if any of you were relying on the, the transcript um, during the live session. Um, I do see a couple questions in the chat. Mark, you want to take those? Yeah. Uh, so the Charles question, we're going to explain from Canvas. Not that I know of, but I will ask Chris, but I think he's joking. But, um, and then, uh, Christina, do we know when VPAT will be ready for official review? We're almost done with it. Uh, within the next month, I actually asked, uh, Chris that. So we are very, very close to having that done. And I think those are all the questions. Oh, thank you, Alan. Yeah, we are very close to getting it done, Christina. I talked to him last night about that, actually. And it's going to be done pretty soon. Uh, it's because it's a lot more than we did before. It's uh, 5,106 total case, cases, which is a 187% increase. 23 VPAT. We're going to be done. And then once we're done with that, we'll start working on the 25 VPAT. Yep. But we added a lot to the 23 VPAT from what it was before. 22 had 2,000 in some cases. Now it's over 5,000. So we're being very thorough on it. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you guys uh, for the update. Uh, thanks to you and Chris and the rest of the accessibility team for all your hard work on this. Um, it's really... Um, you know, inspiring to see how the community is, has come together to address this. So um, definitely um, something unique to Sakai, I think, and something worth, um, you know, letting people know about because it's important stuff. So, um, so thank you. And we have a short break for lunch. Um, nothing planned between now and 12.50. At 12.50, that's, you know, 10 to 1 Eastern time, we're going to start the trivia contest. So if you want to be back for trivia, 10 minutes to one o'clock is when that happens. Um, until then, I'm just going to go on mute. We'll leave the room open. Um, it's going to be the same room for the afternoon. So uh, you guys can pop back in whenever you like, but there's nothing planned until um, the trivia at 1250. See you then. <laughs>